Board of Education for District 208. We start with the Pledge of Allegiance, please. Pledge of Allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. Ms. Nardi, do you have a roll call? Here. 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 Present. Um, do we have uh, recognitions this evening, Dr. Freitas? Madam President, we have many recognition of well, many well-deserving adults and students here. Seven teachers of RB have leadership roles within the College Board AP Exams Division such as readers, table readers, question leaders, and co-chairs of the department. These teachers are Dan Bonarigo, Sandy Chaika, Delaney Garrity, Melissa Gordon, Blair Jensen, Lindsay Minaw, and Dan O'Rourke. An AP exam leadership role promotes professional development and increased knowledge of the ins and outs of the respective exam. We'd like to welcome up Ms. Sandy Chaika. Mr. Freitas, while each of our faculty members come up, can you can we give them a few minutes to kind of let us know what your project or your area was? You don't mind? Sure. <laughs> I mean, these are huge, huge accomplishments, and I don't want to just run them off in a list. I appreciate that. Um, so I work mostly with AP Computer Science A, which is the exam that's all in Java. I also do some work with AP Computer Science principals. In principals, I'm a consultant, so I train teachers around the world. I've trained them here and in other countries like Singapore and Dubai. Um, for CSA, I, am, I was on the development committee for seven years as a member, a co-chair, and then as the college board advisor. And then I've been a reader, as well as a table leader, a question leader, and an exam leader. So I've actually helped to write the exam. I still help to write the exam. I write questions and give them the first drafts. And the now development committee works with them. Um, when I was on the development committee, we finalized the exams. At the readings, I help to come up with the rubrics and um, then train the readers so that they are ready to grade all of our wonderful students um, equitably and um, consistently um, as best that we can. So uh, it's really been quite fun. I'm also now serving on the um, AI, Generative AI Committee with the um, vice, Executive Vice President of the College Board, Trevor, uh, Trevor Packer. Um, to look at how AI is affecting education and what we need to be doing, how to move not only the AP exams, but education in general. Wow. Thank you, Ms. Jackson. <laughs> so how do you have time to do this? <laughs> that's, that's amazing. I do a little bit of everything. You know, wow. you just, you just got to go and keep focused and not think too much about it. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. The next teacher we would like to recognize is Ms. Melissa Gordon. Ms. Gordon? Thank you for you, Ms. Gordon. Thank you. Thank you. Ms. Gordon, any words about the work you do with the College Board? So I'm a, I've been a reader and a table leader uh, for AP Calculus. So depending on the year, I can get questions for either a Calculus AB or Calculus BC. Um, and so I readers, we just go in and we follow the rubrics that the leaders have created, grade us consistently, try to keep everyone grading the same. And then when I was a table leader, I was in charge of a group of readers and double checking, back reading, making sure that they were grading consistently and following the rubrics as they should. So, okay. thank you, Ms. Gordon. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Gordon. We would like to recognize now Ms. Lindsay Minor. Ms. Minor. Ms. Mina. Ms. Mina, a few words about the great work you do? Um, I have not done as much as Mrs. Gordon and Ms. Chica, um, but I um, am a reader for AP Stats, and I think this was my seventh or eighth year doing it, so during that time, I was one of the people that, you know, our table leaders and question leaders trained to grade consistently 
according to the rubric, as they tell you over and over 100 <laughs> times a day um, over the eight days that we grace. So, yeah. thank, thank you very much. Well. teacher in a uh, red and black plaid, so I'm a little disappointed that you know, <laughs> <laughs> I didn't know it was a man teacher matching moment. <laughs> the following teacher has helped bring the Open Educational Research World History Project to RB as its core world history curriculum. The OER project helps prepare students for college, career, and AP history exam and is entirely online and free. Ms. Erin Cunningham serves as the teacher leader in the OER project teacher community. She helps actively develop the curriculum for teachers and worldwide and provides feedback and examples of how she engages her students in the classroom. Ms. Cunningham has attended summers where she collaborates with teachers, hosts AP writing workshops, and consistently reviews the OER world history curriculum to serve her students best. Let's give it up for Ms. Erin Cunningham. Ms. Cunningham. Ms. Cunningham, any words about the great work you're doing? Uh, I think you kind of covered it. Um, yeah, working with the OER project has really transformed my teaching career, and it's brought me into contact with teachers from all over the United States and all over the world. And you know, being able to collaborate online with people and being able to say, hey, I'm doing this in my classroom, and then someone in New York is like, yeah, me too. Um, it's been really, really great to have that sort of um, camaraderie and collaboration across the world. So, thank you. 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 The, um, it's open educational resource. Oh. Okay. The, the Presidential Awards for Excellence in Mathematics and Science Teaching, P-A-E-M-S-T, are the highest honor bestowed by the United States government for K-12 STEM teaching, with up to 108 teachers awarded each year. RB teacher, science teacher, Ms. Michelle Kaler is one of the three Illinois finalists. Ms. Kaler. Congratulations, Kaler. Ms. Kaler, a few words about the great work you've done as a science educator. Um, so presidential, you have to get nominated for it. I don't really know who nominated me. I received an email at one point offering the opportunity to fill out the application. It highlights you as an educator in the classroom as well as a leader in your field. And so it's not only about what you do in the classroom, it is uh, at professional development that you go about, how you work with other teachers. And so I had to not only record myself with my students um, on a lesson, talk about some of the different uh, challenges that I face in the classroom and different ways that I teach. I like to really uh, involve a lot of inquiry and case studies in the classroom, and then also highlight the curriculum writing that I do for um, pre-AP bio for College Board, as well as I write science curriculum for a company called HHMI Biointeractive and present with them. Fletcher, you take a group shot yes. for positive pride. Yes. Okay. Yeah. Okay, and today was flannel shirt day, right? It was. It was, that yes. was not just a, a, a <laughs> That was that was the dress it's day. Yeah. Yeah. It was okay. Because okay. yeah. I'm, I'm looking at other people going, wow, there's a lot of flannel in this. <laughs> Congratulations to the RB students who were awarded the national recognition from the College Board. These students earned this academic honor because of their GPA of 3.5 or higher and outstanding performance on the AP exams. Students were awarded with the National African American Recognition Award and the National Hispanic Recognition Award. These students are Elizabeth Buchanan, Joseph Buckles, Catherine de Jesus, Patrick Hart, Isabel Hernandez, Maceo Herrera Mendoza, and Mariah Watkin Sanders. Oh wait, let's see. Dr. French, who's who? So we could just, uh, as we call them, what we should do. So this is Mariah. Congratulations, Mariah. 
Elizabeth, are you here? Oh, yeah. Elizabeth? <laughs> Congratulations, superstar. Congratulations. Joseph? Joseph is Misael. Misael Herrera Mendoza, Misael. Catherine. <laughs> Congratulations, Catherine. Really proud of you. And last but not least, Patrick Hart. Come on up, Patrick. Congratulations. Congratulations. Hold on. Thank you. And that concludes our recognitions. Thank you, Dr. Freitas and, and team. Do we have any visitor statements this evening? Any visitors for statements? I say we'll call you yeah. up in one second. I say we'll call you up. Yeah, not quite as yeah, yeah. I'm looking. Do we see any visitors? I see a. Yes, no? Okay. I don't see any visitor statements this evening. Um, Everyone okay. we leave will take SA out of order so they can move on with their evening. The student association, he's going to come on on. <laughs> and then we'll circle back and do the district goal update. Yeah. So, uh, <laughs> um, hello, we're so happy that you guys could have us here tonight. Um, we really appreciate it. My name is Emily Hernandez. I am the president of the exec board, and um, I'm a senior. Um, I'm Bella Ventura, I'm the Vice President on the Exec Board, and I'm also a senior. Um, I'm Hazel Hall, I'm the uh, Treasurer, and I'm also a senior. I'm Naomi Gallus, I'm the Secretary, and I'm also a senior. Uh, I'm Lucy Dren, I'm the Director of Communications, and I'm a junior. We are missing one, Alex Jacobs, he's a senior, and he is our student spokesperson. He couldn't be here tonight, he had water polo practice. So. Um, so we are really excited for a good year. We started off our year with uh, freshman orientation where we had over 70 volunteers all recruited by SA members um, to come and help. And these volunteers were split up into 15 different groups where they led tours. They um, kind of showed the incoming freshmen what a day in the life would look like. And they answered all of their questions. Uh, unfortunately, this year had a surprisingly low attendance rate, which kind of surprised us considering the fact that we sent out like save the, save the dates during our future Bulldog Night back in January. We will do that again this year. Hopefully we have better attendance next year. But um, other than that, it was really successful. Um, and all the freshmen who did come were able to connect with their group leaders, learn more about all the activities we have here, and get hyped for a new year. Um, so that kind of brings us to our current week, which is Homecoming Week. Everyone loves Homecoming Week. So our theme is All Roads Lead to Homecoming, which is based around a road trip. Um, our Spirit Week is based off of different stops. So our stops are Miami, Denver, the Hamptons, Nashville, Texas, and then we're ending the week back at home with Barbie Spirit Wear. Um, we have a lot of activities going on this week, such as Penny Pinch, uh, the Pep Rally, and our homecoming of royalty. So we're going to continue what we did last year with the homecoming of royalty um, instead of king and queen. And then our penny pinch is going to Shriners Children's Hospital in honor of Sofia Dominguez, who is a senior at RB. Um, so yeah, we're donating to Shriners. Um, that helped her with her recovery from an incident that happened last school year. Um, along with Penny Pinch and the other activities, we are getting a lot of support from other clubs, such as Girl Up, and RBTV has been helping us a lot. We have a lot of fun stuff happening with RBTV. And along with the clubs, we've also been getting a lot of support from administration with help with the DJ, uh, the door decorating competition, and a lot of all school reminds that are being sent out. 
Um, and Homecoming has been a very big success so far, and we are all very excited that it is. So after all that chaos of homecoming and the first couple weeks of school dies down, um, we plan to start right away on our community outreach, you know, fundraisers, uh, blood drives, all that kind of stuff. So every year we do our annual drives, collections, so a quick timeline. We're going to start working on our first blood drive of the year um, in November. And then additionally, we're going to be collecting and writing cards to the troops um, for Veterans Day early in November as well. And then shortly after that, uh, we'll be in full swing for the holidays, so we'll be doing our Thanksgiving basket drive to, I believe that's CSS, and then also our coat and blanket drive. Um, that's all we have today. Thank you for your time. We're looking forward to a really good year. And do you, does anyone have any questions? No, not seeing any, but you guys are off to a great start, so thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Keep up the good work. Let's circle back to our discussion item on the district goals update, Dr. Skinkus. Included in your board packet is a summary chart. Uh, the administration has been putting in bold things that are in progress, uh, or if there's, they're completed. Uh, there was a question submitted, not many questions. I believe it was dealing with the SMART goal related to teaching and learning, explore and maximize curricular days to foster academic rigor, new opportunities, and social emotional supports. Uh, the SMART goal for this year is step two of the panorama, implement the dashboard that tracks students' social-emotional uh, learning data as well as their college and career readiness. And that goal that was submitted, uh, Dr. Freitas, can you address that for number four? In regards to are there, uh, uh, number five, excuse me, are there, is there anything we can find out in, uh, in relation to goal number, the, the academic goal? in relation to are we doing things strictly for the intervention classes or honors and AP classes? <clears throat> so here are the uh, board goal number four. Yes, Dr. Skinkis? Number, number one, I'm sorry. Yeah, board goal one, I board, think it's like goal the, one, the third, and third task. Or third yeah, task. so on the teaching and learning, here's some of the classroom impacts from last year. Yes, Dr. Skinkis? That no, that's the wrong one. Number one, number one is the uh, word. Ms. Ms. Lindquist, do you want to speak on that? The one about, is there? Here, I can um, rephrase my question. If we can clarify, yeah. because yeah. I don't think we know what, yeah, what you're talking <laughs> okay. about. Okay. So this, was, this was my question. Um, so this is the, the board goal is explore how to maximize curricular days to foster academic rigor, new opportunities, and social emotional supports for all students. So looking at the action steps that are laid out for the 23-24 school year, I think they're excellent. We've looked at them. They certainly support that goal. My question is specifically on the, the third step down, if you will, utilize the implementation integration of data from school links, panorama, to identify students with potential and proclivity toward dual credit and dual enrollment opportunities. My question was, can we also use panorama or any of those, uh, those data points to support students who we can um, you know, suggest go into the AP track or honors level classes? We haven't used it in that way yet. However, I mean, we're more than open to explore that opportunity, but we haven't used it in that way, Madam okay. President. I guess, and the reason I brought it up is I was reading through these, and again, I think yes. they're really good steps, but I want to make sure that we're looking at the whole spectrum of students, um, and if we have data that we could be using to support that cadre, I would, I would think it would be a positive. Some of the yeah. dual credit are AP, computer science, and stats are dual mm -hmm. credit, and they're AP. There's a little bit of that, but I get you wanting to do more. We get a report directly from College Board that is an AP potential report. So when we are looking at identifying students with that proclivity toward AP and honors, that's something that just very easily is pulled from College Board. So it's it's already a report in so and of itself. It's not a separate panorama. So right. So it's not like a separate panorama. Um, you know, drive down type of, of thing. We haven't, I would say, we haven't necessarily explored how to best utilize Panorama for that like dual credit, dual enrollment um, uh, proclivity yet because that really, we want to be able to stress that those opportunities are good for anyone mm -hmm. in terms of what your passions are, what you might be interested in. Um, so I think before we would do that, we would need to identify for ourselves as a school, what are the markers, right, that we think 
best go into those areas. Um, and then we could, I think, expand it to include that if we had um, kind of in our heads or if we wrapped our minds around what is the profile of that student that we're looking for. Mm -hmm. Um, I mean, you see the question I'm asking, right? I want to yes, make sure that we're not, we're not losing. Yes, not that we're losing, not just focusing on the intervention aspect, but that we're looking at mm -hmm. how can we use that tool to reach all of our yes. students and really identify mm -hmm. what's best for all of our students. And I think that's definitely the intervention side, I think, was first and because it's most urgent. And we have some other ways that we have kind of popped into student potential in other areas. But I think as we go through this and are more and more used to the programs, then we can see what their capacity is and be able to tweak it to fit our needs. Okay. But we have That's mechanisms at least in place that identify yeah. that AP honors level student based on PSAT scores, you know, throughout the years and then junior SAT because they give us that AP potential is what it's called. It's a trademark from College Board, so we just use that report. And okay. I would say that AP and honors students have always been identified. So this just brings an equity lens through to it. Because now everyone is given an opportunity to take not just regular courses. So sure. that's how I took it, right? It. AP and honor students, are they've always been fine. They're going to be fine. <laughs> it's everyone else who let's give everyone else a chance. But, to I, but I think there's some concern about how do we identify students that maybe weren't slated for AP or honors as freshmen. We want to encourage them and, and not limit your AP honors enrollment just because you did well in junior high. Right, yeah. it took you a while to come into your own, so maybe it's, you had a, a rough yeah, so that, 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 that's the that's the identify kids who didn't self-identify themselves. Mm -hmm. And I do think RB does a, I think, I think so with some of our open access courses, you know, I'm yes. thinking of Lindsay Minot with AP Statistics, and there are students sitting in AP Statistics who weren't extended algebra when they came in with us. So I do think we do a nice job of continuing that open access. Mm -hmm. um, but we have been trying to use that AP potential with our leadership team and our counseling team to really, because not every kid knows that they're suited for an AP class. They may, they may not have ever even thought that in their wildest dreams. So we let that AP potential really kind of help us there because then it's tangible. We can say to a student, hey, based on your PSAT 10 scores, it says that you have potential to do really well in these courses and it breaks it down that specifically so we can use that information. And if I can add, you know, we have a great partnership with our teachers, you know, and our counselors who know students' strength and areas growth and we trust in their recommendation and expertise as well. So we have great partners in our teachers and counselors. Okay, thank you. That, that, that addressed my concern. I think Brian, you had a couple of comments on the goals too. Yeah, right? mine was really, it was just kind of from a higher up level, um, looking at the end goal, on, or the, the last segment on goal four, um, focus the 2023-24 school year will be on targeting interventions for students, dual credit enrollment, professional development for DEI, ELL resources, communications position, so on. My question is, are we seeing any of this that would be noticed by students in the classroom level? Is this all above? And that's not, that's just really to get an understanding of how that goal is being, um, or how those particular bullet points are kind of being, I don't know if pushed down is the right term, but um, being seen, how would students be affected by it? So, uh, Ms. Matana leads that goal, and so her and I, and Dr. Ferris in our cabinet meeting today, the response was, uh, here are some classroom impacts from last year and into this year. Peer evaluation, providing opportunities for teachers to observe other teachers through additional substitutes. So we're using budget and money to increase the sub-budget so teachers can go and observe and improve uh, teaching and learning. Blended learning, we've increased the number of teachers now and providing um, the number of teachers that are receiving professional development, classroom furniture, resources needed to implement blended learning in their classroom. Uh, mathematics and reading, we provide STAR testing for freshmen through juniors and interventions for those students uh, below benchmark. We implemented a few sections of an intervention teacher this year. Panorama, which is the goal number one, but we provided the SEL assessment for all students to determine any behavioral social interventions. And then new instruments were purchased for all the music students, for not all the music students, for music students. Uh, from this year, we're continuing the interventions above uh, the EL interventions, so of course is for math, science, and the overall coordination program interventions for ELL, which was an additional 0.6 FTE. Dual credit, so we're covering course fees and providing transportations for students to take dual credit at Trite. Dual credit, dual enrollment at Trite. 
and classroom furniture, again, dependent on teachers' instructional strategies. So those okay. are the different things that we've done that have impacted teaching and learning. And I think there's some overlap with what was uh, answered for the question on goal one as well. So I would just kind of like to continually hear a little bit more from how that ultimately will end up affecting students. But I think that's a good overview for now. And uh, you the, the Go goal number five, there's a, no updated. Yeah. That one didn't, I didn't expect that to be necessarily open right now. Anyone else have comments on the, the goals at this point? I just had a brief, I thought we had kind of headers that had like a general summary of some of the goals. So that so I, I went back and looked at last year's after we spoke. And yeah. th this is the format that's been used. It hasn't, it hasn't changed. So when we were in our workshop, though, we kind of had some headers just so that we can kind of refer to them, you know, like, I think we were talking about our, like, our community engagement goal, and we have our new communication person, or uh, definitely to increase um, our engagement with our stakeholders and everything, which is the beige or mauve goal. So now we're, like, kind of describing these as the color of the column. And, but I thought when we were doing the exercise and we were weeding down, we were coming to some consensus on what each of these constructs kind of highlighted. So like um, blue is teaching and learning, pink is community engagement, right. green is diversity, equity, inclusion, right. purple is finance, right. and uh, orange is facility. Right. That's so you're looking for maybe in that top cell to put those words in there so that it's... Kind of. I, I know that with everything we do, we look at a finance lens. We're not going to... You know, when we're looking at academic programs, I, again, you have that finance, we're going to be fiscally responsible. It's not to say that each of those constructs are um, not working with the other goals, but it's a way to talk about them and then make sure that we're addressing all of them. Does that work for the group to, to make that amendment? As far as headings? Yeah. Any objections? Can we do that then, please, Kevin? Sure. Thank you. Well, I also yeah. think it makes it easy for our community, too, to say, I have an idea for one of these areas or mm -hmm. whatever. Okay. Any other comments on the, the goals or the steps? Are we good? Okay. Thank you, everyone. Um, I don't have a report this evening, but I will say that I'm happy to see the school year having, having been to parent-teacher conferences recently and, and seeing the first few months of the school year. It's exciting and um, there's a lot going on here and it's, it's, a, it's a great place to be affiliated with. So thank you all. Uh, superintendent's report. Um, just a couple of general updates. Thank you to staff and students. They've done a fantastic job and we have had a great opening to the school year. We're already almost through September. Um, cafeteria and library HVAC replacement project is almost complete. The day the refer return fans were delivered and installed at 623, were delivered at 623 this morning on a crane before we had uh, our pickup line start up. Uh, they'll be installed the rest of this week, and that was the last large item on that project punch list. The coffee bar in the student cafeteria is almost complete. Some of the equipment has been delivered and installed. Tentative opening is scheduled for early October. Uh, the district has received a lot of positive feedback from stakeholders regarding the efforts being made on the communications front from our new coordinator, Kylie Fletcher, who's here tonight. Kylie is currently working with members of the IT department in Edleo to redesign the web, web page. Um, and so thank you for doing that. That was also one of the um, tasks that was in the job description when we posted that position. Uh, school board workshop on diversity, equity, and inclusion is on Saturday, October 14th. Uh, again, via Zoom, I think we have three board members signed up for that. Um, board members interested in participating need, mail, need to email me this week. Um, again, this is, I'm encouraging the board to participate if your schedule permits. This will provide the board with a general overview of the staff's training and the work that is taking place with diversity, equity, and uh, include the diversity, equity leadership team uh, at RB. Tonight, the board will hear from the four divisionals. This position was negotiated in the current CBA to help support and grow teaching and learning at RB. Uh, the divisionals report directly to Ms. Lindquist, the EP for curriculum and instruction, and so that will be later tonight in the agenda. Um, also this weekend is my superintendent's conference in Springfield. Uh, during one of the conference general sessions, I will be presenting on peer evaluation uh, that we have implemented at RB and the positive impact it's had on our 
teacher collaboration and instructional practices in the classroom. So that's some exciting news as well. And that's it for the superintendent report. Any questions or comments from anyone? Thank you. Then um, are you uh, providing the, the assistant superintendent's report? I can I'm read assuming? that if the board prefers. Um, there were no questions yeah. submitted, so just in general. Do you want to just do a, a two-minute summary sure. and we can receive uh, it? Monthly summary report. Uh, total operating revenue for the month was 777629 which is about 43% coming from property tax. Total operating expenditures for the month were uh, $3,311,395, uh, which is 57% towards salaries and benefits, 20% for purchase services. Um, the summary of revenue shows the district has received 5.2% of our budget revenue for the year. Um, this percentage is higher than last time last year. We were only at 3.69. Um, summary of expenditure shows the district has spent 21% of the budget expenditures for the year. This is similar to last fiscal year. Um, the, the district will continue to deficit spend for the next three months due to the delay in property tax revenue. Um, the administration will continue to monitor fund balances as the current estimate is that the district will need to complete a working cash loan to cover the ad fund in around October or November. Um, again, we're, we're slated to have a surplus by the end of the year, but again, we're, we're reliant upon the property tax collection and distribution of Cook County. Uh, statement of revenues and expenditure report for August 1st, August 31st, 2023, lists all the revenues expenditure for the month. It all also compares budget to actual. Uh, student activity account summary report is included in your board packet. Um, other important facts, 22-23 certified staff compensation report and non-certified staff compensation report. The state requires these annual reports be posted to the district website, so the reports are provided to the board as an FYI in today's packet. Uh, and then the transfer enrollment report, this is an annual report, is a follow-up report from the enrollment projections provided to the board in November. The overall projected in-house enrollment was 1653. The actual in-house enrollment is around 1640, so we're off by about 13 students. I think it's remarkably precise, though. And that is it for the assistant, the assistant superintendent's report. Um, before we post, I just had, I did have a question on that supplemental. It's page five of the salary compensation report. Can we just ask Dr. Smetana to confirm the district paid health for the first individual? Yes, just, I have, I, that's okay. a closed session. I can address that. Okay, thank you. Just wanted to make sure it was not posted until that was reviewed. Dr. Freitas. Yes. Yeah. Good Please. evening, honorable board members and Dr. Skinkis. I would like to introduce Ms. Kylie Linquist, Assistant Principal Curriculum and Instruction, who will introduce our division heads. Ms. Linquist? I am excited to um, be working under a new leadership structure with four really fantastic teachers um, who have been leaders inside and outside of our building um, and have already, you know, it's not even October 1st and have already, I would say, positively impacted um, the way that we view teaching and learning in our district um, in a variety of ways. So if they would come up and join me, um, Mark Ori is our division head for special education. Uh, Mark Helgeson is our division head for humanities, which covers English, social studies, and world language. Lindsay Minaw is our division head for STEM, which is our math and science department. And then Kendra Cagle, who is a new teacher here and a new leader here, um, is the division head for CTE. So she is over our applied arts department, our fine arts department, and our wellness department. And I um, kind of shared with them that I would like them to just share um, out something that they have been working on since the beginning of the school year or um, something that they have been tackling either as a group or individually. You guys okay Do you want standing? them to go to the yeah, microphone? Yeah, you can either pull, pull up a chair. Yeah, I mean, yeah. If Perfect. it's easier to pull up a chair. Stay a while. Don't threaten Mark with a good time. Come on over. By me. We need two chairs. Two chairs. Over here with us. Right in the middle. Perfect. I would just bring it back around, Dr. Freitas. 
Yeah. Yeah. So, Mark, if you want to start sure. on that end and then come down. Start. Hello, everyone. Thanks for having us. Um, so we've been really excited this year to get to um, work as division heads for um, all of the departments that we support throughout the course of the year. Um, one of the things that we have been focused on is obviously supporting academic goals um, in the building and also um, really working hard to collaborate across our departments and rethink how we are uh, implementing and working through PLCs within the district. Um, for example, we're really excited about the possibility of working across departments. Um, within the Humanities Division last week, um, we had English 9 uh, teachers working with world history teachers um, talking about writing across the curriculum, which was really exciting, uh, as well as some of our uh, junior English teachers who um, started working together during the summer, you know, had a conversation with one another, to continuing those conversations. So, um, you know, PLC has been a really exciting thing, uh, and I think Lindsay will pick up with some other things that we've been working on. Before you move on, sure. how does that look different for the students? Like, what's happening at their, their level? So, just the example that I'm sharing, you know, another, for example, um, for students, Working across the divisions means we're able to have um, richer conversations about the things that are going on within the classroom. Um, in working with world history teachers, we realized we were using different language to talk about writing, for example. Um, you know, we realized in English we were using one acronym that wasn't the same okay. as in the world history classes that our students, they were, they were using claim evidence reasoning. We were using something else. So that conversation started between, you know, myself and the teacher leader, and then we thought it'd be a good idea to expand it out um, to both of our departments. Um, so, you know, that's a small example of larger conversations going on um, that are exciting because we're writing, reading, you know, all of that stuff across the curriculum. It's really then impact in the classroom. We're able to share out our writing practices and then um, have conversations about it. We, we understand that some of the skills that they're focused on um, are some of the things that we are also responsible for, but we can also, we also realize we can support each other, you know, through that same, um, through that common language, I should say. Nice. Thank you. Thank you. Um, so also kind of building on that, obviously, you know, humanities, they do all do a lot of the same skills. They have a lot of writing, they have a lot of reading. Um, within STEM, one of the big things that's changing for us is that the SAT is going digital. Um, and so working with Mark particularly, we were able to get a lot of information from College Board, but also kind of train our teachers as to how that looks different than what we're currently doing. Um, and so we presented to um, as my, you know, the teachers in our divisions and then any other teachers that were interested so that they would have access to how those changes are being implemented. Um, we've also been able to look at STAR in a little bit more detail as well as some of our PSAT data and other things on Panorama so that we are kind of guiding those conversations a little bit more. Um, I can speak specifically like I, when I was in science uh, PLC two weeks ago perhaps. Um, you know, talking to them about how we would use the STAR data um, that they don't necessarily have access to, just it's the way STAR is set up. The math teachers and the English teachers have access to it, but we were able to pull instructional planning and kind of look at, okay, how would this work in a physics class? How, where, where do these skills come in in biology? And kind of have those conversations that it wasn't as easy to have before. Um, and, you know, kind of connecting, making the connections what we have done and building on that, I think is what we've been doing a good job of as, instead of being like, okay, this is all new, um, but really recognizing where we were at and using that to kind of build forward. Hi, I'm Mark Corey, I'm the, part of the special ed program, and uh, my role really hasn't changed um, as far as what I'm doing within special education. Um, but I would say this year uh, with PLCs, we've taken a different approach to um, kind of allowing our staff, um, this was a push from a lot of the, the interviews that we had last year, to have more time to uh, have these discussions that Lindsay just mentioned. Um, so my department has had a lot of opportunity to have discussions about students and their needs. Um, we have probably six programs within special education, so there's a lot of moving parts. Um, so we've been able to break out into our little small teams, I call them, um, and have genuine conversations. And um, some of us are focusing on data collection tools, uh, which are linked to uh, our progress monitoring for our students with IEPs. So that's been a, a big push for um, some of our groups. So um, a lot of great stuff going on. We're expanding. There's more students. There's more needs. Uh, we're, you know, we're looking for 
to hire uh, another position. So um, you know, it goes back to just providing for the kids, and we're getting that time. So it's been great. It's been a great start. Hello, I'm Kendra Cagle. I'm the C CTE division head. Currently, um, since I'm new to the building as a teacher and in the leadership role, I'm working really hard to build those relationships with the staff members, um, teachers, support staff, so they know who I am. They also know that I'm here for the right reasons, and that's just to <coughs> support the teachers. Um, my department is very unique in the fact that it is student-led for the most part, and a lot of project-based learning is going on. So there's a lot of things going on at the same <coughs> time. Currently, I'm working on dual enrollment and dual credit. Tomorrow um, is a big day for dual credit here at RB. We're registering approximately 85 students, give or take, in dual credit classes for the spring semester. So that's a big thing. Um, today, I talked with students about um, dual enrollment and what those will look like for the next school year. Does anybody want to share, if it's okay for Kendra to share, uh, what dual enrollment could look like for next year? We already have how many students currently? I that think I there's like uh, eight maybe that are taking classes at Tri-M. Mm -hmm. yeah. I want to say 11 or 12. 11, just okay. Yes. And next year, those opportunities for dual enrollment will be expanded? Yes, so next year we will have six courses for dual credit and that will be welding, fire science, EMT, education, criminal justice, and the CNA program, which I believe the CNA cr program is still currently Right, going so right on. now I believe it's welding, CNA, and criminal and justice. And criminal justice, correct. So they're adding three Oops, additional so courses oh, yeah. at, okay. Oh. Uh, three additional courses at Triton so that um, we'll have six opportunities for our students to take classes at Triton during the school day where we help pay for the fees as long as they keep a, a C average and, and we also help with transportation costs. Yes. Yeah, so. How far are we out for the culinary too? You're bringing culinary too, mm -hmm. right? Well, we're, work, we're, working we're working on, on developing a kitchen for yes. that, hopefully next school year. Culinary has proven to be <laughs> Our most challenging, um, our most challenging, I don't know what the word is, <laughs> pathway yes. to get to that dual credit. Um, when you go through the dual credit process, there's an opportunity for the department chair at Triton or Loyal or COD, whichever school, to provide feedback. And we're still in the kind of back and forth with Chef Manny at Triton. Um, we are working to fulfill all of the you know, things that he wants us to fulfill, but that is one of the courses that is kind of in queue for hopefully potential dual credit for next, next year. year. Yes. Yeah. Can, so you, you talk about the PLCs, right? Can you kind of walk us through, what does that look like? Is that your like weekly meeting together in the group? That's like, on, I, yes. I, yes. I think I kind of know, but how did, how does that like play out then? Because I know like there's a late start, right? And so your whole team kind of meets and then... So it's different. It's different weekly. Okay. Yeah, it's Thank different you. weekly. We were actually in a meeting today where we were just kind of planning that out if you want to speak to that. Yeah, and just to make sure I'm clear, you're asking across all divisions? Kind of in general how it works? Well, unless you're uh, vastly different, then maybe each of you can say how you do it in your group. Yeah, I mean, we, for laymen, like how for you, PLCs is on, uh, as professional learning communities, uh, why we have our late start on Thursdays. Okay. So it provides the divisionals and teacher leaders time to work with their departments right. on specific initiatives. So it's like an hour, an additional hour of collaboration and planning. So then you could touch a little bit on what you guys are doing. Right. So essentially we have, um, we've been developing a menu of options that we can choose from for this year. And, and our goal as, a, you know, division heads as a team is to be flexible, to be responsive to whatever needs are arising at any given moment. So um, when the opportunity to provide the, the full length practice uh, SAT, the digital practice SAT, um, came up, we, we explored that and, and, and as Lindsay was saying, provided some support through that. We trained our staff on what is going on in the digital SAT, what to expect from it, you know, how we plan to implement it. Also had them within PLCs, bring in your Chromebooks, exploring it on their own, um, so we could be there to support them as they're walking through it. But our menu of options is essentially we can meet with our whole divisions um, if we feel that's important. Uh, for some of us, for, for me, for example, I've got uh, roughly 40, some 40 people, I think, in my division. So that's it's uh, difficult to find a space for that. Um, we have department meetings that we can have depending on what departments have um, needs at the moment. We can ask people to work in content teams, work 
across their content teams, we can meet with individual content teams, um, or we can meet across departments uh, and across divisions to have people having conversations across those. And, and, and essentially, you know, as Lindsay just said, we, we sat down today at our um, Tuesday meeting, the, the four of us uh, along with Kylie, and kind of mapped out through November and December what we think are going to be the needs as we are anticipating that they're coming up and how we're going to best address those to make sure that um, we're supporting teachers so teachers can support students because in the end that's what it's all about is making sure that the students needs are supported in the classroom does that answer your question yeah. so yeah so right now it's looking like you kind of have very similar goals but you could be working on very different things, right? Mm -hmm. Depending on your Kendra's, areas. Kendra's department or division is a great example okay. because when we're talking about English and math and science, that those those core courses that kind of directly link to SAT, mm -hmm. we're talking more data review of what's going on in those classrooms. Now this year, we have um, found a way to utilize STAR in such a way that I'm able to go in there and pull out skills that the entire sophomore class needs to work on, regardless of what class they're in. And so that is is an easier way to involve fine arts, wellness, applied arts, because we're able to show what skills all of our kids need, and they can integrate those into their courses. But there are times when the applied arts people need to be working on their dual credit applications, and the wellness people need to be setting up their fitness grams, and the fine arts people might be doing a completely other thing. So Kendra's the newbie on the team has probably got the biggest challenge for <laughs> kind of herding all of those cats and getting them all into one place because they do oftentimes look different. Sometimes for Mark with special ed, he might be in-servicing his, in -servicing his whole department on something that's really important for co-teaching or for case management. And then there are other times when he will dispatch his department into their core departments where they're doing their co-teaching. And then he might be with them in you know a division meeting with Mark or with Lindsay, um, just kind of depending on what those needs are. And I hope to the board that it's clear that we're all working together for students and for teachers. So that's what everyone's doing in their work. Thank you everybody for coming out tonight and the board will like to meet with you again. I think we talked about possibly mid second semester so they can get a status update and um, uh, academic initiatives that have started to implement and the PLCs are working on and things we're starting to plan for already for the following school year, correct? Mm -hmm. And then maybe at that time we could talk about our progress on the academic goal and your mm -hmm. academic dashboard. Sure. Okay. Thank you. 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 Dr. Freitas, you want to finish up your report? Yep. <clears throat> Under teaching and learning for the month of September, acknowledging the very same people that are here, the staff reviewed the intersectionality of the PSAT and SAT star assessment and its focus skills. The goal is to increase the overall percentage of juniors that meet the ERW and math benchmark. So these are the people that co-created the academic goal, and our goal is to increase the overall percentage of students meeting that. For the month of October and the Teaching and Learning Day, October 20th is Institute Day. It is a non-attendance day. It'll give us an opportunity for us to work as a building together to develop and grow. Under school culture and operation for the month of September, tomorrow is coffee with the principal at 9 a.m. in the faculty cafeteria. In October, October 9th is Columbus Indigenous People. That is, not, uh, that is a non-attendance day. October 19th, it is parent-teacher conferences, and we are continuing with the virtual conference. That has been um, very well received. Our attendance has increased you know, as far as parent participation. So it's worked very well you know, for the overall culture of the school. I believe, Kylie, um, it opens up on the 10th. Scheduling window, yeah. yeah, scheduling window opens up on October 10th, where families could begin to uh, sign up. Can they come in person if they don't want to do it online? Well, th there's always an opportunity for parents to schedule anything with a teacher. So th that has happened before, you know, on any given day. Our teachers meet with parents, you know, regularly, you know, during their planning period. So there could be an opportunity for parents to meet, you know, with their teachers. But the overwhelming response from our survey that we did last year 
was that parents appreciated the virtual conferences so they can call in from work and not have to take a day off to stand in line mm -hmm. and check. Yeah, I was just saying, if yeah. anybody was uncomfortable, I would just want to know if that, that was an option. On that day, I don't think it's an option, but they could schedule a separate time. A separate time. Correct. Okay. Yes, not on that day, but on either day, yeah. of course. Yeah. Um, in the month of October, just a week ago, uh, excuse me, um, I had an opportunity to visit myself or Mr. Manning at a peach. We had an opportunity to visit Revis High School and explore concealed weapon detectors, the CWDs, a uh, concealed weapon detector. For those who haven't seen it, it's very similar, but not a metal detector. It is like the 2.0 version. You know, those devices, you know, detect, you know, the size and shape of metal of certain, um, you know, weapons, etc. You know, they don't detect like keys and phones. And uh, I mean, it was a great site visit. This is one of many that we have scheduled. You know, right now we're in the exploratory phase, in the research phase. I could see this at least lasting, you know, throughout the year. You know, I could see them also coming here, presenting to our superintendent and possibly to staff members. But just, just so the board knows that we're always exploring ways to increase our safety procedures and processes here at RB. So, we so, are so Dr. Freitas, that's obviously a, a, a big topic. So I would think um, at some point in a, a Friday update, if we could get some background information on where they work and cost and some of this, some of the details as you're going through your process, of course. Would be helpful. I was General able, flyers. Yeah, of course. And I was able to. We we have some pictures. We have some videos. You know that are, um, you know I'll mm -hmm. submit to our superintendent, and he will share with you, so you guys can see how they look. You know, day in and day out. But again, from the visit, it, it worked great. You know, Revis is a school of about 1,900. You know, kids, I didn't see you in any major delays, you know, but, you know, if anything, I mean, kids were coming in and now beeping, they were being checked and sent right in. But, you know, it's something to explore that we're currently doing right now. Special thanks to Mr. Manning and Mr. Petrick for the visit as well. Uh, and the activities and athletics for the month of September, the 25th, um, which we just had a senior night for a girls golf team. In the month of October on the 3rd, we have senior night for girls volleyball versus Ridgewood at home at 5.30. Um, on the 5th, we have Senior Night for Girls Tennis versus Ridgewood at 4.30. October 6th, we have Senior Night Football Game versus Thorn Ridge at 7.15 here at our stadium at the Canelli Athletic Complex. We will also be recognizing our cheerleaders, our band members, our palms, our hip-hop athletes, etc. And on the 13th of October, we have Senior Night for Boys Soccer versus Kennedy at uh, 5.30 JV and 7.15 Varsity here at the Canelli Athletic Complex. And that concludes my principal's report. Now, a couple to of the minor questions that were submitted, I think you corrected some of the date correct. Cor yes, 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 all the dates have been correct. So ex excuse me. The principal's report. So I think it's our student advisors. You guys are up. Um, for the student advisors report, um, for teaching and learning on in September, uh, something a lot of the students um, have seen is the blended learning reflection. Um, some successful strategies that we've experienced within our own classrooms and then we've seen with others is that providing students with a guideline or an organizer, such as giving them a calendar, letting them know this and this will be assigned this day and we will go over it this time, or if not, um, they also assign us ed puzzles or YouTube videos and then we have to write down notes for them, but then also reviewing those notes with the students, at least like leave some blank so that you can go over them again with them so that they can either either ask questions that maybe they could have forgotten in that time of while watching the video, but also helping them improve like communication between the teachers and the students. And then for September, for school and culture and operations, on September 15th, we began the Hispanic Heritage Month with Olas, um, sponsored as Ms. Trevino and Mr. Venegas, um, Hispanic Heritage Week, Spirit Week. We had Loteria Lunes, uh, Bandera Day, which was bring your jersey, where represent your, um, your part of Latino America, where you feel like is home to you. And then you can also either represent that with a flag or with a jersey of a team. And then Loteria Lunes, we did di a, like a competition between the different age groups of students um, where you had to come dressed as this, these certain cards, um, as in bingo, 
and then whoever dressed up the most, what grade level dressed up the most, um, won that day. And then we had piñata day, which was be colorful, show any color, um, be fun, <laughs> basically. <laughs> and then on Thursday of that week, we had si se puede day, which is a big um, debate in the Hispanic Latino culture where you come from parents who are immigrants, you try your best, because you know at the end of the day, si se puede. As long as you keep pushing, you keep going, and you get that diploma, you get your job, you do whatever you can, but at the end, se puede. And then on Friday, we had Vaquero Viernes, which was Western style. Um, it's very popular in Mexico with um, ranchos, farms, um, and we thought we'd like to um, represent that in a way um, for that week. And then we also started Mariachi Club, which is a new club this year, sponsored by Mr. Loeb and Mr. Baum, and uh, student leader uh, Angelina Figueroa. Um, I am also a part of the club, and I honestly love it because I love my culture, and I feel like this is a good way to show and then represent and then teach those who possibly don't know a lot of like old like mariachi music that we get to show that in a new version with our own okay. um, twist within it to our community. Yeah, I saw the video um, that was done. I think it featured primarily Dr. Freitas for, um, for the week, and it was fabulous. So. <laughs> Thank you. And moving to athletics and activities, um, for September, girls were runner-up off, runner up in the Upstate 8 Conference and are headed to the Glenbard East Regionals um, this Thursday, September 28th. Boys golf had an undefeated conference season and are headed to Glenbrook North Regionals tomorrow, Wednesday, September 27th. Um, looking forward, this Friday, September 29th, we have our homecoming football game versus Thornton at 7.15 uh, p.m. for varsity at the Kenley Athletic Complex. And as Student Association mentioned earlier, uh, the 30th is our homecoming dance from 7 to 10 at the Athletic Complex. And I believe that concludes the Student Advisors Report. Great. Thank, Thank you both. You. Any questions, comments from anyone? Okay, moving on. We're good. Um, old business. I don't think we have anything specific to life safety, capital improvements, or sustainability, Dr. Freitas. Okay. So under new business, we have um, a submission of course fees. It's a first read. First read, and Ms. Lundquist is here. She did uh, correct the chart. If you want to come up, Kylie, and go through your chart with the board, please. My apologies for the flipping of increase and decrease <laughs> on the chart, but it has been. Um, it has been corrected. So what you see uh, in the chart that I provided, there are 12 proposed changes to course fees for next year. The increases um, reflect things like the increase of registration in programs that courses um, may attend, um, competitions that they may compete in, things like ILMEA um, for music courses, um, some increase of the shirts that students wear in honors leaders training, um, and the addition of uh, Apple exams to some of our lower level language courses. Um, when you look at the decreases to fees, um, we have in all of those cases in the rationale, what we're showing is what those course fees pay for. What's not included there is kind of what we dropped off to make those decreases happen, which are supplemental texts. So previously, um, prior to our new textbook series, we were using more supplemental texts um, to fill out the curriculum in those courses. We are no longer using those texts. We don't need those anymore, so we don't have the need to purchase some of those extra um, items. So that's why we were able to drop the course fees in those um, areas. So this is a pretty um, light year uh, for course fee changes for next year. Um, I think the only question was on the flip okay. uh, of, that header, of that header. There are no, typically at this time I present um, course requests for new courses or course changes and there are not any of those for this year. Um, courses that would be 
coming tonight would have had to have been proposed last February. So that's why on the memo um, for this report, I included the timeline at the bottoms because I think it's helpful um, to see. And it's something that we've been working with division heads too to make sure that our teachers really understand the process and how this works and what the timelines are. So this coming February, if there are courses that people would like to propose, that's when we will receive those in February of this school year. April, May is when we would do our um, leadership approval and when I would bring it to the curriculum council for the members of the board to take a look at what those proposed changes might be um, and then this time next year I would be getting ready to put those if approved by the board into the curriculum guide for courses to be taken in the 25-26 school year. So it's a two school year differential. When you propose something in the 23-24 school year, you're looking at students being able to take that course one year out, so that 25-26 um, so school year. You propose it in 23-24, you can course select it 24-25. Yep, and you, you take, take it 25-26. I was just laying it out there. Okay. Yeah. Um, and that's helpful to see it, I think, you know. One thing I did do, just because it's something that I'm very excited about, um, and Kendra was here, um, this is something that Kendra has worked a lot with um, so far. While we don't have necessarily any new courses that are going into the curriculum guide, we do have, actually going on this year, several um, new courses. I think enough is coming around for you, Mr. Novak. Um, we do have several new course offerings that are dual credit. So I think it's just nice. I was updating the curriculum guide and I'm trying to make sure um, that, um, oh, you got one? No, I need one. Okay. Um, we're trying to make sure, we're trying to make sure that we're really communicative with our families um, to make sure that they understand what dual credit is when a course they're signing up for is dual credit. So I've gone through the curriculum guide and really made sure to kind of flag those opportunities, make sure we address things. I remember Ms. Gaska, we talked at one point about making sure families know you're, when you start a post-secondary transcript, it comes with you. So if you decide after your dual credit starts that you don't want to take it anymore and you drop out of it, now you have a W, a withdrawal on your post-secondary transcript, right? So we're trying to make sure that we over-communicate those things. But I thought this looked... This is, this is very impressive to me. This is very exciting to me. Last school year, students had six potential opportunities for dual credit. Four of them were advanced placement, the courses that are in orange on this chart, and two of them were the RBTV courses that were newly dual credit last year that we actually found out after the school year had started that COD was giving us retroactive dual credit for any student that was involved in RBTV. The key there is that it's at any level. Intro to TV, dual credit. Advanced TV, dual credit. No matter what you do in RBTV, you have an opportunity to be earning college credit through College of DuPage. Um, this year, so we had six last year. For this year, we had seven new opportunities, which is huge. They're all out of our applied arts. Um, department. So everything in purple is in our applied arts department. So Patty Sarkady and David Weissar really, really, really worked diligently through the second semester of last year, through the summer, through this fall, submitting transcripts, submitting work hours, and tweaking course descriptions and syllabi to really work in tandem with the folks at Triton College to give us dual credit offerings in now 13 areas as opposed to six the year before. So what I have in the curriculum guide and what you can now see here is a one-stop place where you can see here's the high school course, this is what it lines to in the college, this is the college where you get the credit. This is how much it costs. Um, the only one of our dual credit opportunities that has a cost associated with it is the Loyola opportunity through those advanced placement courses. 
Loyola has not raised their fee for our dual credit students since we started. So it remains $65 a credit hour for a student that's taking dual credit through Loyola. And at Loyola, it's $788 a credit hour. So it's a 92% savings for our students that are going dual credit that route. If they're going dual credit RBTV or any of our courses through Triton, it's 100% savings because they are not charging us additional monies um, for students to come. So I think it's just, we're, I'm going to keep obviously adding to this list as um, Ms. Ruska asked the question about culinary. We are we have two applications in at Triton. Both of our culinary teachers have submitted their applications and we are working with what do we got to do to make this work. Um, we have two of our wellness teachers who have submitted applications to have a couple of our wellness courses taught potentially as dual credit and we have, we're trying a second try with one of our Spanish courses. Um, so we have some things in the hopper right now that we are working on. September 30th is our deadline. So we're getting all of our ducks in a row and Triton and especially the individuals from the Des Plaines Valley region have been really, really instrumental in helping us um, to get those dual credit opportunities for students. The dual enrollment opportunities that I shared with you um, earlier are really exciting for us as well especially the EMT and the fire science. I just think people are going to go crazy for those. We already have, um, Beth Augustine shared with me that we already have one student who might be interested in the dual degree program, which we heard a little bit more about at our DVR conference um, this year. The pilot program of that has four young ladies from Ridgewood who are graduating in May with their diploma from Ridgewood and an associate's degree from Triton. So that is kind of the next thing that we're working on too. But I just wanted you, just because I didn't have any new courses, you know that I like to stay up here as long as I can and talk with you. So <laughs> I just wanted you to see the really awesome work that we're doing by more than doubling our dual credit opportunities in one year. So just quick kind of logistics question. Is, is the idea in the curriculum guide to call us out as its own page? Both. Both. So oh, I was I think that's important because I think they otherwise they get lost. The curriculum guide is, is a meaty document. Yes, right? yes. Okay. So what I've tried to do is put it in a bunch of different places. It's a standalone page mm -hmm. and then within each of the departments, anytime a course is dual credit, I've banded it in yellow and it says right there students are eligible to take this course dual credit should they choose with a variety of different ways that they should reach out contact their counselor so i've tried to thread it in so many places that you can't miss it okay. miss fletcher sending out this flyer on the new we're gonna get that to her yes we are gonna get that to her i have not done that yet um it's also gonna go the dual enrollment flyer has that qr code on it so that students can take a snap and they can sign up right there and then counselors know this student is interested. We're we're following up. So in addition to Miss Fletcher being able to blast that, we're going to have it hanging around the school in posters and flyers, um, so that we can really drum up that interest. Our goal is to maximize whatever seats. We don't know what that number is yet from Triton, but we want to maximize whatever opportunities they give us. So we want to garner that interest nice and early. So we're going from three to six in dual enrollment. Yep. Three classes where they're taking that trade. Now there's going to be an opportunity for six next year. Yep. Yes. Going from six to 13. To 13. 13. With four kind of in the works for next year, potentially. Possibly more than 13. Yep. Yes. Right? 13 is this year. 13 is current yes. right now. Yep. From six last year, 13 this yep. year. Awesome. One quick question. So, that, I mean, that's fantastic. And yeah. this has been growing and we've been pushing for this for a long time. So, definite growth and development when you talk about goal number four and goal number one, mm -hmm. like, maximizing curricular day, <clears throat> maximizing the budget to pay for kids to get uh, credit. I think there's something important we need to make sure we highlight to parents. Kids that take these AP courses, they can get dual credit even if they don't pass the AP exam, correct? Correct. correct. So if they, if they pass the AP exam, are they getting dual credit and additional college credit? Like I, I, that's something we should probably clarify. Mm -hmm. Don't need to answer that tonight. Because mm -hmm. I know we offer more than four AP courses. Correct. Yes. These are AP courses that also get dual credit. Yes. So Correct. if a kid takes an AP course because they like computer science and want to try it, but they don't want to sit for the test, they can still earn dual credit if they pass the class at Loyola by Panda. And it helps if a student gets a three on the test, because I've had students take the statistical course. 
Right. No, I'm saying that. But see, that's what right. I'm saying is but that's how they get AP College Board credit. Right. But they don't have to take the AP test, and they can still get Loyola University yeah. credit just for taking the yeah. class here. So that, that's Correct. the point to, to so clarify. We need to clarify yeah. on a couple of those. That's right. a great question. But where it helps, because sometimes here where a parent takes, a student takes an AP course, and they assume they'll do well, certain colleges will only accept a five. Correct. Mm -hmm. But it's a Loyola Tra uh, it's a Loyola transcript, so let's say you took the test and you got a three in you know, AP. You might not, you'd say, well, I'm not going to get college credit for it. You are be if you also signed up as a dual credit. Correct. So mm -hmm. that makes it That's very... That's the point I was trying to say. That yeah. Yes. I understand. Yep. It makes it uh, for and parents and students, you can't lose. Right. You know, they're, it, it's a nice option. And I was just going to ask one follow-up question to both those. Do the parents understand that dual credit is a little different than AP? You don't have to be, like, top of the class or something to take these and still get college credit. I, I, can't, I can't necessarily say for sure they understand that. It's our goal to make sure that we communicate that okay. appropriately so that people know there aren't barriers to any of these classes. Yes. Um, you know, in terms of prerequisites or certain grade point average or anything yeah. like that. Yes, that's our that's our goal to make I, sure I they think understand. You probably have a definition, Pedro. You define dual credit, dual enrollment, mm -hmm. advanced placement. Yeah, maybe that's somewhere where in the curriculum guide. So there's yep. a nice, easy cheat sheet. Yep, makes sense. Would I be able to make a brief comment? Yep. Sure. Absolutely. Um, Love it. So, uh, I am uh, an office age during one of my uh, periods throughout the day, and we handed out slips for the informational meeting about all these new classes that have been introduced for this dual credit. And um, coming from AP Computer Science principles where we were um, told what this dual credit opportunity is through Loyola, um, and then giving out these slips, some students were asking, well, I'm not taking an AP class, what is dual credit? I have had students that kind of looked at the slip like, huh? And then I explained it to them, and they showed interest in that. So by, I feel, increasing the awareness of the fact that we have these classes that are gaining this opportunity, as well as the fact that we have these classes that in the future will be gaining this opportunity, mm -hmm. more students will gain interest in this, and therefore we will have more students enrolled in this dual credit program. Yeah, agree. Thank you. Yeah. And the whole plan of the dual credit, continuing to increase this in dual enrollment, is for college and career pathways. Mm -hmm. Kids get exposure to career pathway courses, right? They're earning dual credit. So even though it may not apply directly to their major, it could still apply to their general ed just to help reduce college costs, cost the tuition towards parents, and parents are helping with those costs. Um, and like Kylie mentioned, the eventual goal is, you know, a kid could eventually get to a point to where they're graduating high school with a diploma and close to an associate's degree. You know, that, that's a huge, that puts them a step ahead of their competition from other high schools. Yeah, and it's not only college, because if you graduate high school with your CNA, you, you're working. Right you're now. Work. Yep, you're right. working right now. Or if you can get some certification in culinary, you, you can step into a hotel or whatever, yep. and you're working. So welding, that's a huge help mm -hmm. to, mm -hmm. to come out of high school and be able to walk into mm -hmm. something. One, one, one more point of clarification before we let you go. You're you wanted me to stay. Sure. It's okay. <laughs> <laughs> you said it. You said earlier when uh, Miss Cagle was here, uh, you're signing up 85 students for dual credit this week. So it's, it's interesting. Point. So that's one of the challenges with the the Triton madness and the dual credit. <laughs> so our students obviously pick their courses very early. Um, so a lot of the opportunities some of the opportunities that have come down and we've gotten approval for happened after kids picked their courses, right? Like what happened with the retroactive COD with RBTV because that process can be so back and forth. Those 85 students that Kendra and Patty Sarkady are pulling out tomorrow are students who are already registered for the RB course, right? And they are pulling them in to let them know, hey, this course is now dual credit. Here's what we need to do to register for that, right? And give them that opportunity to register. So we're still in 
that doesn't surprise me, that feedback that there were some kids that were like, hang on a minute, what is, because some of them happened after they registered. Not every kid that signed up last year to take electronics technology knew that it was going to be dual credit because we didn't know it was going to be dual credit until we got that approval, sort of like the blessing from Triton. So in some cases, and, and it may always be, a little bit this way. In some places, we're playing catch up mm -hmm. with Triton because depending on culinary, for example, how long we go back and forth until we get the stamp of approval, that stamp might come after kids have signed up. So that's why now in the curriculum guide, we're trying to make sure that we very much make it very clear and then uh, Miss Augustine does a really nice job. If we get something retroactive after the fact, we're sending notice home to families. We're letting them know this is what is happening and this is what this means. And then Kendra can come in when the kids are here and scoop them up and, and answer some of those questions and help them through the process. And there's no cost. No. No cost. Super exciting because when you get into college, you have to take those 12 hours of humanities or something. <laughs> you're like, no, they're done. They're already done and paid for. So it's really a big help. Great job, guys. Thank, thank, you. You. thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And if I could just add, you know, I do want to commend this board and the superintendent. You know, your goal directly aligns with the needs of our students and parents' desires. So thank you very much to the board and our superintendent for really, you know, giving us a goal that's actionable and helping us expand our opportunity. So thank you to the board, our superintendent, and Ms. Gaska, who has been supporting some of our students right thank out at Trenton through her career division. So thank you, Ms. Gaska. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. Uh, moving on to field trips. I think we have field trips from both the theater group as well as the ski and snowboard club. Yes, they are not one club. <laughs> there are two different clubs. Um, Dr. Fraser, we're, I sent you a couple questions. There was this question about And this minimum. is a first read. Just want to confirm. Correct. This okay. is a first read, right, Dr. Fraser? This is a first read. Okay. You had a question about uh, is, is there minimums and do you, are you is the snow club or the ski club concerned about the December twenty third trip? Yes, I do have. So traditionally, the the ski club, you know, they kind of program three trips. You know, the goal is to, to do them all, but at times they only do two out of three. The minimum is forty seven. But some of the challenges they face, right? If there's no snow or it's too warm, right? There's no way they can go skiing. But uh, so the minimum is 47, and most of the time, you know, Mr. Shermack and his co-chaperones are able to get, you know, those students. I have gone on a few of those my, myself, and they're great, but, um, you know, our goal is to ha aim, aim for three to do them all, you know, but at times, you know, the weather doesn't cooperate, so there have been some cancellations, you know, but the minimum 47, pending that the weather And you're not concerned about it being the day before Christmas? No, no, no. Traditionally, the first trip has always been between the 21st and the 23rd. We're right around the Christmas Eve, you know, so that that's not really different from previous trips. Right after finals, go and break a leg. Yeah. <laughs> Don't please don't. <laughs> <laughs> that was a joke. <laughs> uh, uh, so, I mean, are there any here that are uh, significantly dependent on board approval tonight, or can we go two weeks and approve them in October? Oh, no, no, we can wait. Yeah, the trips are not to January and then December, so there's just plenty of time. Were there any the other board. questions on the specific trips? Those are the ones that okay. were submitted. Okay, so we'll just, we'll just uh, make sure it's clear in, in two weeks if these are distinct approvals. Uh, any visitor statements? I'm not seeing any here this evening. Uh, we had no discussion items requested. Any consideration of items for future meetings from anyone? Um, yeah, I have uh, two. So okay. one, there is an October uh, Illinois Association School Board event. I will get the details to Dr. Skinkis for the Friday update. So they're still trying. I don't know who all the speakers are yet. So hopefully Do they have we'll a know date? that. Have they pinned down a date? I don't have that for you either. So I'm hoping to have that for the Friday update. Um, and the one, the other one, I'd like to put out there for discussion. And whenever last year we were talking about our foreign language. I don't know if we've moved ahead in that or we have some new plans because we have Spanish now. And I think we and have French. maybe one, French. one unit French. We used to have German. We used to have more years ago. Are we thinking um, 
expanding that? Do we have different options through working with online universe? Whatever. I, I don't I know if that's part of the question. conversation. Yeah. So the question. Well, obviously the curriculum person just left, so that would be a question that we could maybe ask uh, the administrators are scheduled to come October 10th to give their annual update on the uh, performance uh, benchmarks for the high school. Um, so maybe I can include Dr. Freitas can include that. But uh, one of, remember, we did talk about this a little bit with the board. The, there is not really an opportunity to expand those curricular offerings in the building unless we find Petro that are dual certified. So we would have to find a need <coughs> or post something with somebody that's dual certified so that they're not only a German teacher, but maybe they teach history or because there won't be enough sections to offer a full-time German job or a full-time, we're starting to see it with French or we see it with music, right? As you start to increase dual credit, dual enrollment, there's less, there's only seven periods for a kid to pick something. Right, and so part of what we threw out about six months ago, are others, well, I'm sure other schools have the same dilemma. Are there online accredited courses that we, you know, we could tap into or something? Yes, we already offer that. It's a part of our curriculum guide and board policy. Kids can take those online courses <coughs> and get foreign language credit here. Four so that's already, at, that's already being offered. So I think, and I don't need to know this next month, but you know, as a school that's uh, competitive and looking for college, um, it's still kind of interested in our foreign language program and what we're offering, how we're talking about it. And that could be three months down the road, but I just want to put it out there. I, I like the idea of incorporating it into that next update from uh, Yeah, it could be a couple Linquist. months, right? Yeah. Just put it on the list, you know, what do we see in that vein? Because I think it's going to be a two-year requirement coming. 28. 28. Mm -hmm. 28. So 20, 20, how can we be ready for that? And, you know, any novel thoughts? Yeah. Any other Topics for future consideration from anyone? Looking, looking? Okay. <clears throat> I think uh, we can move on to matters for closed session. Appointment, employment, compensation, discipline, performance, or dismissal of specific employees of the public body, student discipline, individual student matters, purchase, sale, or lease of real property, probable imminent or pending litigation, collective negotiations, and school safety. We have a motion, please. The Board of Education, Township High School District 208, Cook County, Illinois, enters closed session for the purpose of considering the closed session matters as presented in the September 26, 2023 Board Agenda Packet. Second. A second from Mr. Van Horst. And would you need a roll call, please? Mr. Yes. 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 Okay, thank you everyone.